Have you ever been in a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness, or a proponent of any ideology really, and after beating a dead horse on a given topic, you know, once both of you have exhausted all your arguments, the conversation sort of undergoes this reset, where your opponent merely shifts back to an earlier premise? Have you ever seen that? I was a regular pioneer for years, and I've talked with countless believers since leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses too. So my life has been saturated with argument. It's why I simply have no stomach for debate anymore. I'm worn out, guys. I'm tired. In this video, I want to address that issue of circularity or dialectic regression. I want to show exactly when and why it happens in conversation with JWs. And I want to discuss how to escape it. It doesn't always work, but my advice is highly successful. Stick around. Hey everyone, thanks so much as always for stopping by. Okay, so let's just examine a couple of scenarios of how this works. Let's say a believer comes up to you and asks why you're no longer a witness. This is rare for them to approach you, but it's just a hypothetical. They might even start by asking who or what stumbled you, something like that. And depending on your background, your starting point will vary. If you're an atheist, for instance, you might begin with asserting there is no good evidence to believe God exists, and there's even less evidence to support that he inspired the Bible. Not one of my favorite starting points. I actually do believe there are good proofs in that direction. But some folks like to stake their position here. If you are a victim of corruption within the organization, however, you might choose to bring up the Australian Royal Commission and how witnesses harbor pedophiles, or how shunning is immoral, unscriptural, and an act of aggression. Or you might just start with doctrinal issues. You could bring up how they dubiously arrive at the date of 1914, signaling the onset of the last days, and how they used to assert that this generation will not pass away until these things have happened. I mean, there are so many starting points. Take your pick. Let's just use that last one, though. I want to show you exactly where JW reasoning becomes regressive. As an ex-witness, you're likely very knowledgeable on this teaching. You know how they arrive at October of 1914 based on biblical numerology. Luke 21 verse 24 speaks about the period called the Gentile times, or the appointed times of the nations, which started with Jerusalem being trampled on by the nations. And you know how they link that with the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians as occurring in 607 BCE. Daniel 4 talks about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you know, with the symbolic tree banded with iron, and how an angel declared, let seven times pass over it. Then they jump to Revelation 12, indicating that three and a half times equals 1,260 days, therefore seven times would last twice as long, netting out at 2,520 days. Then they skip to Numbers 14, or Ezekiel 4, talking about a day for a year, ergo the 2,520 days converts from days to years, which takes us from 607 BCE to 1914 CE. Okay, that's the doctrine in a nutshell. Got it. Now I'm just going to reenact how a typical debate would go between a believer and a non-believer on this point, just to demonstrate how frustrating and circular JW logic often is. The ex-witness could say many things. They might start with how there is very little beyond the watchtower to suggest that Jerusalem even fell to the Babylonians in 607 BCE. Secular sources are overwhelmingly in agreement that it happened in 587 BCE. The XJW might insist that the biblical language is deeply metaphorical and could apply to anything. It's like interpreting poetry by Don Henley, Leonard Cohen, or Gord Downey. Who's to say for sure that's what the dream in Daniel and those numbers even meant? Or the ex-member could bring out how the generation of believers who were born in 1914 are most certainly deceased, run down the curtain, and passed on. They're a dead parrot, as Monty Python would put it. As you see, an unbeliever could go in many directions with it. The Jehovah's Witness, on the other hand, may respond with David Splain's comical overlapping generation rebuttal, or how secular dates and archaeology are unreliable because they're employed by Satan to gainsay accurate Bible truth, which is, of course, 
whatever the Watchtower teaching happens to be at any given moment. Or they'll say, proper biblical interpretation consists of weighing whatever it says against itself, essentially using the Bible to understand it. But everyone knows you can use the scriptures to defend any position or interpretation you like, from capital punishment to pro-life, pro-choice, political activism, neutrality, slavery, abolition, abstinence, indulgence, and countless failed doomsday forecasts. You can link any scripture to another and have it say whatever you want. But again, all other positions departing from the Watchtower are wrong. Whatever the governing body's current understanding happens to be is always the right one. And if it changes, even by doing a complete reversal in many cases, this is because the light is getting brighter. A failed prediction from the Watchtower never qualifies her as a false prophet or religion. Or the witnesses may even say something along these lines. I never agreed with the governing body on this or that, but it's hardly my place to correct them. Leaving is absolutely unacceptable because we have the truth. Abandoning the JWs is harlotry with false religion. God calls it foolishness, stupidity, or likens it in Proverbs with a dog returning to his vomit. Mark my words, for certain Jehovah's Witnesses, there is simply no penetrating that firewall. Ultimately, this is what the circularity or regression always boils down to. The Jehovah's Witnesses are God's one true organization for disseminating scriptural truth, because that's what they happen to be preaching at any given moment. And any past or present mistakes, corruptions, falsehoods, and lies committed are always something else, because the governing body never peddles in religious falsehood. Accurate scriptural interpretation and true religion is just what the Jehovah's Witnesses are always up to. If you're a believing witness, I want you to just think about how circular this is for a moment. How can you condemn someone as stupid or foolish for abandoning the truth when it's the veracity, the correctness of such doctrines, that's precisely what's been brought into doubt? It's just like the United States foreign policy. Everything counter to what America is doing is a disruption of the international peace process. Why? Because peace just happens to be whatever the United States is up to from moment to moment. So American exceptionalism would be another instance of this sort of logical regression. When you affirm something enough times, such as labeling your beliefs the truth, those viewpoints become true by definition, because they're always connected. So that was a foray into 1914. But these are the acrobatics that go on in any debate with a really entrenched witness. Not all of them, mind you. I'm speaking of the most entrenched ones. Take anything, though. I'm not a Bible believer, but Jesus said, by their fruits you will recognize them, right? He said, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love among yourselves. So when members leave, due to the absence of love, most evident in the Watchtower's unscriptural, immoral, and destructive policy of shunning, among others, they're only heeding Christ Jesus' identifying mark of genuine discipleship, no? But to the Jehovah's Witness, leaving is simply unacceptable. Everything they do is defined by love. Even when they shun people, it's really a spiritual remedy and an expression of God's merciful discipline. See what's happening there? It's a contradiction to say the Jehovah's Witnesses are not identified by love because love just happens to be what they're always up to. Let's just take a classic witness line when accused of being in a cult or having leaders. They might pull one of these arguments. The scriptures say, call no man your leader, so the governing body are not our leaders. I don't work for any man. I don't answer to any man. I answer to Jesus Christ. Okay, well, that sounds very sensible and democratic, doesn't it? Then why don't you speak out when elders misuse their power over the flock? Or practice nepotism, for instance, when circuit overseers wrongly influence a judicial decision, when the governing body says and does things counter to scripture and common sense? 
After all, they're not your leaders. I believe it was Voltaire who said, to learn who rules over you, simply find out who you are not allowed to criticize. You can redefine words like leader as the day is long. But who is someone you are not allowed to criticize or disobey? Have I made my point? You see, to a Jehovah's Witness, they don't have leaders because, you know, that's just a little too political and or culty. Jehovah's Witnesses are neither a cult nor political. Only Jesus is their leader because that's true Christianity. And as we know, true Christianity just happens to be what Jehovah's Witnesses are always up to. So, of course, the governing body might take the lead, but they're not our leaders. This is the intellectual treadmill of someone who's indoctrinated. Now, most Jehovah's Witnesses aren't quite as transparent as I'm making them out to be. It typically takes at least a half an hour to an hour to expose this logical regression. On any given issue, once the witness has basically exhausted the two or three predictable reasoning book answers, this is what the conversation degenerates into. When you know to watch for this iconic regression, debating becomes profoundly boring because you see through it. So that's what's going on. But now for the important question. Why does it happen? Well, it actually happens for a very simple reason. Human beings need to have a belief system. Belief systems orient our lives. True, not all ideologies and philosophies are made equal. Some are only supported by one or two arguments before they fall into regression or circularity. Others are more sophisticated. But try to watch for this when you're talking to people, or better yet, when you're observing your own thoughts. You'll learn a lot about yourself and others when you do it. This has even been proven objectively through Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorems. Kurt Gödel was an absolutely brilliant logician, and he demonstrated through math and logic how any given axiom, that is any self-evident truth or operation, can never hold within it an accounting for its rightness or justification for the way the operation functions. The axiom or system must always expand or be contrasted with similar ones to reveal a reason for its operation. For the indoctrinated person, however, an explanation like this qualifies as some deception through philosophy and vain deceit, as Ephesians would put it. That's why the Jehovah's Witnesses are vulnerable to this problem of circularity. If you want to learn more, I'd suggest watching my video on confirmation bias and what is truth. They'll be linked below in the description and in the end screen. As I've shown, it's possible to escape beliefs when they become problematic. You can escape them not in the sense that you can walk around as a pure skeptic. No, I don't mean that. Pure unbelief is technically impossible. But you can escape belief in as much as you can learn to become aware of them. And you can identify them when they begin to either make regressions back to earlier premises or when they circle back to one self-evident truth. That's how you bring yourself to recognize them. But how do you make others self-aware of their own belief systems? Remember, nobody really thinks they have a belief system. Everybody is more or less convinced they're in touch with reality or truth. Truth is what we have. Beliefs are what everyone else has. So how do you help people become aware of them? Well, for certain individuals, it's absolutely impossible. But here is the most effective method of getting your points heard. Get contextual. Make it clear to your interlocutor that you're not in the business of asserting absolute truths, nor that your views are wholly incompatible with theirs. This is not patronizing. Trust me, there's always something to agree with in almost anybody's opinion. You might have to really dig to find it, but when you get accustomed to speaking to people like this, they'll generally come around and allow a space for your perspective. So that's the solution I've found most successful. If you have friends or relatives in this religion, it'll depend on how locked in they are. But always be prepared to concede a point when the witnesses have one. There are many things I've mentioned in this channel I agree with about the Jehovah's Witnesses. 
They're a fairly close-knit people. They're typically well-dressed and groomed. They're very welcoming and hospitable. They fought for countless civil liberties we rely upon daily. They're nonviolent. They try to lead upright lives. There are countless areas of agreement you can start with before mentioning that you don't feel those are necessarily a result of having the one true God or religion. In fact, when I've taken this approach with my friends and relatives, they're usually burning to ask, well, if you agree with it so much, why did you leave? See the difference there? Now they're begging for your opinion as opposed to you forcing it on them. Isn't that better than starting the conversation in anger, interruption, and conflict? Besides, it always gives you the upper hand when they get a little defensive on you. You can just say, I know you struggled to see my point, but you asked for it. I'm telling you, it's not going to work any miracles, but it is the best method I've discovered thus far. I know I've touched on these things in the past, but I wanted to speak specifically on circularity today, as there will be some future content I intend to reference this work in. Let me know what you think of all that below in the comments. Thanks as always for watching, and we'll chat again very soon. Take care. Hey guys, did you like this video? You know what to do. And if something I mentioned today resonated with you, click one of them cards on this screen. I have lots of related content sure to interest you. Thanks as always for your views, and we'll see you next time.